Okay, you guys are set to get okay, going. Okay. We're going to start off with a little video. All right, it was up. Go. and I'm one of the adult services librarians here at Bulletin Public Library. I'm here today to give you guys a little bit of a taste of what the library does. First, I'm going to introduce you guys to our sorting room. This is a room where the machine automatically tells where each of the items needs to go, which is cool. Okay, so let's head on over to find out a little bit more about what we do in adult services. Hey, you got a minute? I do. Great. Would you be able to tell us here a little bit what we do here in adult services? Yeah, here in adult services, we maintain a fiction collection, uh, thousands of DVDs for checkout. We have newspapers, magazines, as well as a great audio book collection as well as nonfiction. We have books in Spanish, Korean, and Chinese. When we were hoping, we used to have a lot of programming as well. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. We have the Distinguished Speaker Sphere, as well as Town and Gallon. We show movies once a week, uh, monthly as well. Various other programs we had. But we can out to our community since we're not able to offer these same services by increasing our online presence and increasing our online resources. We have uh, Overdrive books, ebooks, and digital audio. We will start with Judy Booth, our library director. Judy, you're on mute. There you go. Welcome, everyone. Um, so uh, I'm Judy Booth. I'm one of the lucky ones who quickly discovered that even though I live in a nearby city, 
uh, it was the Fullerton Public Library that would best serve my four children and me. Um, I started out as a cost analyst in aerospace and, and there were the four children. So it was much later that I got my library degree. And uh, I worked part time at our Fullerton Public Library. And after graduation, I was so fortunate to be hired as a children's librarian. And besides doing story time and buying uh, picture books, I also got to manage the bookmobile. And a little bit later, I managed the Hunt Branch Library, which has its own exciting developments, which we'll talk about later. Um, after the Hunt Library was closed due, due to lack of uh, budgetary support, the staff and the collection moved back to the main library. And in a few years, I participated in a nationwide recruitment for library director and was hired in 2017 as the library director after a year as being the interim director. director. And needless to say, I'm devoted to making our library serve our city in keeping with its designation as the education community. Next slide, please. So the library director responsibilities, there's a lot here, but it's uh, basically as a department head in charge of what happens at the library. So there's personnel and the collection of items that we circulate to the public, as well as the, the budget and the facilities and uh, the programming activities we take part in. I also act as a, uh, an advisor to the Library Board of Trustees, who we'll talk about a little bit more later, and provide support to our uh, friends and our foundation. Um, we also look at uh, new policies and activities for our library, and these are presented to the Library Board of Trustees. And um, I also get active out in the community to promote the library within the community. I'm also connected with all of the library directors in Orange County, as we all are in our different functional uh, levels so that we can really uh, work as a library community to provide services throughout Orange County and keep track, especially in this recent pandemic, really um, tapping into our colleagues who have the same function as we do to um, make sure we're serving our, our community as best we can. Um, also, we obviously every month we're preparing for the board meetings and also working on the annual budget to present to the uh, the library board tr trust board of trustees to uh, push uh, up the train uh, up the up the chain to the council to consider as they look at the entire city budget. So, what's unique about libraries? Well, libraries are for everyone. And uh, we've we've worked really hard on that. Our mission statement, although it's a, a little bit on the long side, I'm going to read it to you because it's very important. Uh, the mission of the Fullerton Public Library is to serve the diverse needs of our patrons, foster learning, provide resources, inspire creative thinking, and bring the Fullerton community together. It's a place where information and items of recreational, educational, and leisurely interest are collected preserved and made available in print and electronic formats. Whatever connects, connects people to ideas and concepts, it's here at the Fullerton Public Library. And um, you'll also see that we um, also have the board adopts uh, that we are part of the, the American Library Association's freedom of speech and freedom of the press doctrines as well. And we review this every year, as you can see from the date. We also have a vision statement. I won't uh, read it to you. I think for me, the, the thing that speaks to me most is the idea of lifelong learning. And we want to promote that within our community. And then we have slides about the, the American Library Association's a Library Bill of Rights. Uh, next slide. One of the things I think is, is noteworthy in our as we think about our recent times, is that this was first drafted in 1938, and it was designed to, quote, speak out against the growing intolerance, suppression of free speech, and censorship affecting the rights of minorities and individuals. So as we can see, this has been a, a longstanding um, goal to reduce those barriers. And as you can see, there's the various, uh, I think there's seven, uh, planks of the Bill of Rights uh, for libraries. And it can covers, um, obviously, the freedom to read, but also uh, privacy issues as well. Go ahead with the next slide, please. And, uh, and as you can see, if you keep going, next slide, please. 
And it even it goes into exhibit spaces and meeting rooms available to the public on an equitable basis. Um, uh, and also, as you see, the last one is about privacy, privacy and protecting personally identifiable information. It's very important to librarians. So we get to library funding. So um, we are supported, of course, by the general fund of the city. And you'll see our uh, piece of the pie is the, the purple one down there in the lower right-hand corner. Uh, it's 4% of the library budget. And uh, uh, one of the questions I get a lot is uh, they're curious about uh, when we were doing passports, we're on hold right now due to the pandemic. but. Um, does that money go directly to the library? And actually it offsets our expenses. Uh, so there are revenues from the meeting rooms, from passports, and those offset the expenses we, uh, the funds we use from the general fund. So uh, that funding is not quite enough. Uh, fortunately, we have two support groups that help us financially, and they are the Friends of the Public Li Fullerton Public Library and also our foundation. And you'll find out more about them a little bit later, but they also augment our activities to reach out to the community. Next slide, please. All right, so library organization, it takes teamwork, as they say, to make the dream work. And we've got quite a team. So here's uh, the top half of our uh, org chart. So we have myself, and I uh, report to the Library Board of Trustees, and they are appointed by the, the City Council. And of course, uh, you all, as the electorate, elect the City Council members. The City Council members also uh, hire the City Manager, and I am also accountable to him. Uh, it's Ken Domer these days. And um, I work with both of them for the betterment of the library in line with what the Council is is working toward. So uh, two of my assistants are uh, part-time. Uh, one handles the general administrative activities up in the administration. Also, uh, she books our meeting rooms. And um, we also have a board secretary, very important. Um, there are lots of rules to follow to properly um, hold our meetings about with the board and um, uh, our board secretary helps with that. Fortunately, she had previously worked as the general secretary for the whole department, so she has a lot of expertise, and we are very fortunate to have her on hand to help that. And you'll see the main library and the Hunt Library. Again, uh, more about the Hunt Library later. Um, and here at the main library, we have two managers. We're divided up into the children's services and the adult services. And um, you'll see more in the, in the chart below. Go to the next slide. And there's the other staff that supports each of those four divisions. So we've got the children's uh, staff, we've got the adult staff, uh, and you can see the variety of, of jobs within adult the adult staff, from archivist to uh, young adult librarian, as well as a, we have a, a Spanish speaking librarian, which is very helpful. And then we have um, our circulation department. Uh, we are uh, really pared down these days. You can see that we have um, some part-time um, uh, benefited and some uh, unbenefited uh, part-timers and uh, only just the, the one benefited full-time employee. And then in technical services, and you'll find out more about technical services, but then again, a small and strong staff right there. Next slide, please. I would like to introduce the president of our Library Board of Trustees, Joshua Dale. Hi there, folks. Uh, let, me, let me know if you have any problems hearing me. I have a little bit of a connection issue, but uh, uh, and so you don't get to see my shining face, but I'm certainly happy to be here with you guys. Uh, and I'm certainly pleased to uh, serve as a, a board of trustee for the library as well as the president for this year. So uh, the library not only has uh, oversight and control by the city council, but it's also uh, uh, overseen by the Library Board of Trustees. There are five members of the Library Board. Uh, there, each member is appointed by a member of the City Council, and we try to meet you know, the fourth Thursday of each month. Sometimes we have to meet more, sometimes we have to meet less. 
Each member uh, serves for three years unless they come in on a shortened term. And in general, a trustee can only serve uh, two terms. So uh, sometimes you'll see folks only serve three years, four years, uh, depending on, on when they were appointed. For example, I was appointed midway through a term, and so I'm not going to quite do six years, but uh, I'm, I'm glad to serve however I can. Right now, our current members are Ellen Ballard, and she was appointed by Council Member Silva. Uh, and her term, her first term, uh, I should say, I'm sorry, her second term is going to expire in 2020. I was appointed by Council Member Fitzgerald. Uh, Mr. Mansuri was appointed by Council Member uh, Zara. Uh, Sean Payton, uh, who was last year's president, was appointed by Council Member Bruce Whitaker. And Carl Byers was appointed by Council Member Flory. And so we, sir, we are appointed by the council members, but we also, in a way, um, ha are independent uh, to some extent. And so uh, let's go to the next slide, please. So what our obligation is, is to try to promote the mission of the library as much as we can. And we're technically, we're a board that's formed under the education code, but we also serve at the pleasure of the city council. So we assist the city council in identifying those things that are most important for providing library services within the city. Uh, we generally propose a, uh, a yearly budget to the council for the council to approve. Uh, we uh, identify staffing issues. We approve uh, uh, compensation uh, plans for members of the uh, library staff, such as the director. Um, we try to seek out funds, not only through our budgetary obligations with the city, but through alternatives. Uh, and, we, and we seek out support from other groups, such as the foundation and the friends. Uh, our obligation as board members is obviously to attend all board meetings and and uh, and answer questions and, and and vote on those things that are important for continuing to uh, to to fund and maintain the operations of the library and and we also uh, participate in outside groups to the extent we can in order to promote both the mission of the city's library as well as to identify resources which might be helpful in uh, the library, providing library services to the city. Next slide, please. And let me know if there's an echo there. Because of the poor connection, I've got you guys on phone as well as video. So if, uh, if you're getting any feedback or if you need to switch over to phone, let me know. So um, you know, in addition to those, those tasks, uh, our main goal is really to interface with the staff, including uh, Ken Holmesley and Judy Booth. And obviously we rely upon them to, uh, to help us make decisions that are, are important and helpful for providing services. Uh, you know, so you know, when we're looking at issues like budgets, whether it's for the main library or whether we're dealing with an issue like the, the COVID pandemic and trying to figure out what sort of services we can provide under those circumstances. We rely heavily upon the library staff's input and, and we're certainly grateful for it. Uh, and, and it's something that uh, we work hand in hand with both the city council members as well as with uh, the city manager and the staff members like Judy to make sure that uh, we are to the extent we can with the budgetary restrictions and other restrictions uh, providing the most library services for members of the public that we can. And with that, I will turn it back over to Judy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joshua. I'll now talk about our support organizations. Uh, uh, go ahead, next slide, please. So uh, both of these organizations are here to support quality library services through fundraising and, and as volunteers and being advocates for the library among the community and uh, and among their elected officials. Um, we, they conduct the library's mission and the plans and uh, they advocate to the library for the library to legislators. And each of them has a liaison to the library board because we all wanna be working in the same direction. Next slide, please. All right, the Friends of the Library, they were established in 1961 and they have been going very strong. Uh, this pandemic has really uh, dealt a blow to their activities. Um, the, the friends would, uh, every Monday morning, almost all the friends would gather and sort books that had come in and some of, of the members Wednesday, Friday, so you can imagine not being able to come in, not us not accepting books at this time, donations uh, due to the pandemic uh, has been very, very difficult. 
they miss the volunteerism that they have been involved in, and we miss them too. Um, in the in the normal operating hours had been um, our uh, the bookstore was open set, uh, six days a week from ten to four. Now it's at this time it's closed, um, but you can also support the friends when you shop at to the smileamazon.com a website. You can make them your favorite charity. Um, there is always opportunities to become a member. Uh, you can also get a discount by joining as a member for $10 a year at their three days and one day sales, which are on hold right now. Um, and um, so we're, we're eager for them to get back to work. We'll see how the health orders go and what we can manage to, uh, to work on. I, I think this, this experience of the pandemic has been making plans and, and connecting with others about best practices and following the health orders and seeing when certain things can come into place. Next slide, please. And the Library Foundation was founded in 1994. Um, it started with um, the purchase of a piece of property. It's um, across the street from Morningside on Bass and Cherry, just um, um, between Beachwood School, Elementary School, and Bass and Cherry. And, um, it is now uh, in the process of being sold and the, the proceeds will benefit the library. So the investment account that has kept adding to it and the, the, the library gets a, per, a rolling average percentage um, from the foundation each year to use for various projects, most of them large projects. But uh, in the, for the expansion, you'll see this later in the history of the library, the foundation has stepped up as well as the friends to provide great amounts of money for the expansion in 2011. They provided a half a million dollars for all the furnishings that uh, were needed to uh, outfit the library. So there are very most recent purchases have been our new self checks that happened in the last two or three years and also our new security gates. So they're very important um, both to our um, library. Uh, next slide, please. And so uh, when you walk in the library on the right hand side, you'll notice some beautiful wooden paneling and it has plaques. That's a place where donors can be recognized. And if you're interested, uh, you can certainly see uh, how you could have your name on the wall. And this is cumulative. So if you, you could start out as a contributor and over the years continue to uh, add to that uh, donation. And please also recognize that it's all for the library to uh, be part of your, your end of life um, concerns, such as a bequest. Uh, those we have received quite a few requests over the years, and it's a very important way for us to uh, take on some of the big projects we've needed to take on. So we it, we sincerely appreciate that. Next slide, and here are our board members currently, and just like the friends, they are always uh, looking for more uh, board members to join them. And you know more. More people makes the lighter lighter the work, and also the variety of skills that people have within the community. So we really hope that people will consider um, joining us in the library, uh, either as a friend or as a foundation member, or consider uh, taking on uh, the, the trustee role. And certainly, we would love to have more members of the come to our board meetings because it's really your input that helps us know where. There's areas of, 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 um, of need that we can fill as a library. Next slide, please. So library history, gosh, 1888, so, so long ago. And uh, here we are, uh, it started with Gem Pharmacy. And uh, there was a bookcase there. The bookcase is currently just to the right of our local history room. We still have it. And uh, that's where the public began um, uh, a little library and then as you can see um it was always free of charge that's the american way right next slide please and as we move along the 1902 there was a free reading room uh at the corner a northwest corner of commonwealth and spadra now harbor boulevard and it was in 1906 
that uh, the first uh, free public library was established for the city under Ordinance 46, just two years after the city was incorporated. So it wasn't long before we were so fortunate to be one of the towns that got to have a Carnegie Library. And it is it was at the same place where the museum center is now. Um, we have very few pictures of it. Um, here's a couple of them. And um, we're very, very fortunate. Not, not every community got that. Now, you, you'll see the interior. You notice the, the grandfather clock. Now, that is the same clock we currently have in the children's library. That was um, purchased for the, the children's library in 1909 by the parents who really felt that a clock was something that was needed in the children's library. And so, as I understand it, they had um, ice cream sales and little socials, nickel and dime at a time until they got about $100. And they had someone who had a pickup truck and they drove to Los Angeles to buy our treasured grandfather clock and bring it back for the children's library and it is moved obviously it's in our current uh, children's room and um, it's very much a favorite of of children and uh, we were very fortunate when a girl scout troop um, disbanded or outgrew and couldn't pass on their troop they donated the the leftover money in their troop to our um, grandfather clock and we had some refurbishing done that was very, it was very wonderful to see it have its life extended. And yes, every Wednesday, uh, Mrs. Jacobs, who you'll meet later, uh, winds up grandfather because yeah, you can see it's not a pendulum clock. It has weights in it that, that last over the course of a week. Next slide, please. All right. So um, the Carnegie Library also was kind of outgrown. Uh, I think Fullertonians like their libraries. So a separate building was built. Uh, to the side of the library, but um, they had to make way for another another building uh, to replace it that was bigger. And so this was moved up to Hillcrest Park. And as you go uh, north on Lemon, you'll notice that as you part, if you pass um, Hillcrest Park, it is uh, now kind of referred to as the American Cross Building. And uh, I believe in in better times, it can be rented through Parks and Rec. So that's a, another benefit. And then we get to the World Progress Works Progress Administration building uh, that was funded through the WPA, and that is where the Fullerton Museum Center is now. And you can recognize, and you'll see that there's a children's entrance and an adult entrance. And here's the staff. Next slide, please. And then we get to the 1950s and the bookmobiles, and. Uh, I, I love I love these pictures. Uh, the bookmobile at the bottom is the one that I had I took my kids to, and that's the one that I later managed. Uh, I love the two pictures in the middle because they are the same bookmobile. Um, they just they just decided to spruce it up and paint it to represent the '60s and the '70s. Bookmobiles are very um, dear to my heart because uh, although I occasionally went to the city library in Riverside, I more often rode my bike to the Alpha Beta once a week where the bookmobile in Riverside would go and um, have very fond memories. And I think it's a, it was a very important outreach tool of the past, uh, although kind of expensive um, when you consider the, the cost per book. So we're always balancing these things. And one other thing to note is this, again, the city of Fullerton introduced the very first bookmobile in Orange County. And you'll see we're, we've been first a lot of times in the past. We have a very rich history with our library. Next slide, please. All right, so we get to the Hunt Branch Library, and that was uh, built. In, that was uh, uh, built in 1962, and eventually was uh, given to the city uh, by Norton Simon and the, its found, his foundation. And um, it's a beautiful facility. Um, let's go to the next slide. And uh, there, it looks rather stark. It, it, there's a lot more foliage. Um, and you can see the statuary that was there. I went there earlier this week because we are now embarking on a partnership with uh, recently uh, approved partners by the city council. Uh, it is uh, the Heritage Future and Arts OC in a partnership with us that we're developing to use the Hunt Library to make it more publicly accessible. After it closed, as I mentioned earlier, 
um, it was rented to our one of our neighbors, um, a church next next door, and um, and now we'd like to uh, figure out ways to join in a partnership and make bring it back to the community for use. As you can see, uh, the little girls there on the left, there are three of those patios that each of the three corner three corners, the fourth corner has the utilities, but there's three of these beautiful atriums, and of course the lighting, one of my favorite pictures of the Hunt Library is at nighttime with all those panels of ceiling lights lit. Truly, truly beautiful. And I'm so excited um, to begin this partnership and maybe look of, for ways to involve the Muckenthaler and also the Fullerton Museum Center, which we realize uh, in the near future will be closed for a few months um, or, or for whatever period it has to be. And I'm looking forward to really having this partnership just bring in all parts of, of Fullerton, not only the community, but to expose the visitors to our city to not only the great arts community we have here, which is also very busy at, at Fullerton College and Cal State Fullerton, but also our beautiful trails and, and walk areas and parks. Um, so it's a very exciting time, and I hope uh, many of you will get involved in the process to, um, to launch this. All right, so we finally get to the main library where we are right now. And so that was created in 1970. A joint powers agreement was entered into between the County of Orange and the City of Fullerton to uh, raise money through revenue bonds. And then eventually the main library was built and dedicated in 1973. And it, it, it abandoned the building that then later became the Fullerton Museum Center. Next slide, thank you. And then in 1999, um, there was a, an expansion to really improve mostly the children's room. I think a little thing, a few things had been done to circulation, but um, that that made a huge difference. And as you can see, the foundation raised $318,000 and the friends added $45,000 to this expansion. Again, very important uh, supporters. And, and we were also able to get um, an upgrade in our technology from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We're grateful for that. So we have in 1986, the Fullerton Public Library became the first public library in Orange County, again, to computerize their, our circulation functions by checking in and out books with barcodes. And then in 2006, uh, the, we, the library celebrated its 100th anniversary, and I happened to be an employee then, and it was, was great fun. Now that director, he was really brave. He invited an ostrich to join us. Now, ostriches, they get a bad name, right? But um, the reason why we have an ostrich as our mascot has to do with the plumes the ladies wore in the 1880s when the library was established. And um, our ostrich was not behaving itself, but luckily no one was injured in, in the little kerfuffle that happened. So now we have in 2011, uh, our current expansion of the library. Again, um, in that situation for years before, probably 15 to 20 years before a needs assessment was done because they realized that there were some deficits as the library uh, continued to be used by the public. For one, I always thought it was odd when I entered the library as immediately um, confronted with, with the great big monster um, um, monitors, computer monitors, and that was right in the lobby. And he had to look really hard at where was the librarian to ask a question of. So that we in that in that expansion, we created a computer area, a teen area, and also a way to enjoy the library without having staff there to mind the collection or check things out or receive books back from people. And we have the conference center. And of course, some revenue sources were added in addition to being able to rent the conference center. And that is our cafe and also an opportunity for the friends to have a bookstore. So here's our library cafe. And again, it's closed. Our uh, concessionaire is very eager to open when it's safe to do so, and we're, we're eager for that to happen as well. And we're going to go to Ken Holmesley, our adult services manager. Welcome, Ken. Hey, thank you. Um, get my computer to work again. Sorry, I'm doing 
Thanks. Um, so just a real quick brief background about myself. Um, I have two master's degrees. I have a master's degree in history and a master's in library and information sciences. Uh, both are from the University of Alabama, one in Birmingham and one in Tuscaloosa. Um, I have a you know, wide array of background in different libraries. I've worked public libraries, uh, I've worked academic library, I worked at UCLA as the Richard Neutra archivist, which was a very exciting project to work on. Um, prior to that, I worked for an architectural firm. Um, I started after that, I worked for an architectural firm. But prior to that, I worked in Washington, D.C. at the Library of Congress in the Geography and Map Division, and that was a, a very fascinating uh, experience. Um, just real quick, you know, so as everyone else, the educational backgrounds for a librarian, you know, we have a four year undergraduate degree, but we also have, you know, a master of library uh, in information science. Some of them are MLSs, some are MLIS. It just depends on the school that you went to, but they're all accredited by the American Library Association. Um, you know, school librarians as well have to have an MLS degree. But they also have to get a teaching certificate. So, you know, it's very extensive. There's a lot of training um, and a lot of uh, our librarians went to uh, San Jose State. Um, and we even have uh, one of our library technical assistants is currently in the program. Oh, sorry, actually two, we have a part-time uh, LTA and a full-time LTA both in the program. So uh, we, we wish them well in, in that experience. So my responsibilities uh, are, uh, threefold. I have uh, three divisions that I manage. I'm the adult services division manager, which is adult and teen services, and also includes the local history room. Uh, the second division I'm a manager for is the circulation and passport services. And the third division is the technical services division. Um, luckily for the both the adult services division and technical services, I have a senior librarian and uh, in circulation and passports, I have a library technical assistant too, uh, which is uh, extremely helpful to, to running those departments on a daily basis. I also assist the library director with the library budget, uh, any facility issues that we have. It's you know, a little over 60,000 square feet and it was built in 1973. So as you can imagine, we have a lot of issues with the facility. Uh, we work with a lot of other departments to uh, resolve those issues. Uh, I also work with the director on security issues. Uh, we have two security guards that work very closely with us uh, that help us out with any issues that we might be having. And I also serve on several city committees. Um, so the first division I talk about is the circulation and passport division. You know, passport and is currently closed. Uh, but what are the functions of a circulation desk? Uh, many of you are probably familiar is that where is that's where you go and check out your books, but it's also where you get your library card. So they're responsible for lending materials to library users, so checking uh, materials in and out, uh, monitoring any materials that might have uh, damage and routing them to uh, staff for repair or replacement. If it needs to be repaired, it goes down to the technical services department and they see if they can repair. Uh, the the item if they can't then it's sent to one of the librarians in charge of whatever uh part of the um collection they're in charge of to see if they want to reorder the item uh circulation is also in charge of charging and receipt overdue fines um and they send out overdue notices to borrowers uh that's done uh, either by email or by phone uh just to we have a couple of notices that go out just to remind you to return the materials. Uh, they communicate with the public via the telephone and email. They assist patrons at the circulation desk, uh, and they maintain the stacks. Um, you know, all the, the books have to get reshelved by our pages, and both the children's and adult services have pages that uh, help um, maintain the stacks and make sure everything's organized by the Dewey Decimal System. Um, so we have library pages, as I mentioned, that shelf books. They help us set up rooms, uh, the Osborne Auditorium and in the Conference Center room. And we also provide uh, computer technical support uh, in our computer labs. We have library clerks that assist patrons with library card applications, account issues, and they're all also certified passport agents. Uh, we also have two uh, passport agents in adult services. 
Uh, one is a fluent Spanish speaker, and the other is our, our backup. Many of you are familiar with Jason. Jason's been with us a long time, and he's a jack of all trades, and he switches from adult services to the circulation and passport services as well. Uh, and then we have library technical assistant. Um, and that's our su uh, circulation supervisor. Uh, she resolves issues with patrons concerning overdue, lost, and uh, damaged materials. Uh, and more importantly, she hires, trains, schedules, and supervises other circulation staff. In fact, she's the one who is supervising curbside pickup at the at the moment, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Now, material sorter. This is a favorite amongst our staff. It saves us a ton of time. Uh, as you can uh, probably know, we're the only library in Fullerton, so we're extremely busy. We have a little over 575,000 items that get checked out annually. And this sorter divides everything up for us. You put an uh, item in one at a time, it goes through the belt. Um, and uh, the left hand side is for children's materials, and the right hand side is for uh, young adult or teens and adult services. And then that one that's closest to the screen is uh, items that uh, have an issue with them or have holds. And, uh, and people, it prints out a roll of receipt and they go and grab the book and they put it on the hold shelf for people to come pick up their holds. Uh, currently, you're not able to do that, but we do have curbside pickup. You can call us with uh, your request. Um, you know, the phone number is 714-738-6333 and just press zero to speak to a live person. You can also email us uh, your requests, especially if you have a lot of requests, that might be a little bit easier for you. And that email is info at fullertonlibrary.org. This information is on our website. It's also on all of our social media pages. Uh, and it's been really fun, been really busy. Uh, we've instituted a few weeks ago, and we've already done 500 curbside uh, pickup appointments. Uh, and we only do the appointments between one and four, so that tells you how busy we are. We spend a lot of time in the mornings making phone calls, checking the emails, and gathering materials uh, for people to check out. So, you know, this is a Monday through Friday um, service. And um, if you need to come in a little bit earlier, give us a call, and uh, our circulation staff will be more than happy to work something out with you to you know, provide you with the time to come pick up books. Um, you can also return your books. Our outdoor return server that I just showed you a moment ago is open. So don't wait until the end of the month to return your books. Go ahead and start returning them now. Uh, be nice to us. Start returning them a little bit now because if we get them all back June 30th, June 30th we're, we're going to be really busy, really busy. Um, but if you call on a Friday or Saturday or Sunday, you'll get the, you know, a voicemail, uh, so it's best to send an email and just give us a day or two to get back to you because it does take us a little bit of time to go through all those requests that we receive over the weekend. Um, now, adult patrons currently can request up to five items, and children may request up to ten items. If you go a little over that, don't worry, you know, we can can get those items for you. But you know, go through those items and return them, and as soon as you return them, we can get you some more more books and DVDs and audiobooks to to check out. Um, staff retrieve your books for you, um, and uh, they'll arrange a pickup time between, again, between 1 and 4 p.m. Monday through Friday. Um, and we, we, we'll probably expand this service hours as needed. If we have more people that need to come in earlier or a little bit later, uh, just make those requests and make those adjustments as needed. And we plan on carrying out curbside service for the foreseeable uh, future. Um, I, I use it at Home Depot, Office Depot, Best Buy. I, I love it. Uh, so I hope you guys are enjoying it as well. Um, one of the, the services that Circulation is also providing is what we call Fresh Reads. So uh, every morning, uh, if you browse our Instagram stories, you can call and you can schedule uh, to pick up those items with your curbside pickup. And uh, this shows you the uh, many kind of duties that our, our our circulation staff are involved in. They help us with finding out, you know, some fun ideas for social media posts and uh, help decorate the library during the seasons. Um, so they're, you know, they're they're also have a, a wide range of experience, and we we value them dearly. Um, passport services uh, in 2017 it had its 10 year anniversary. Uh, 
Um, and it's a great way for us to reach out to different people in the community that might not realize the, all the services that are available at the library. And so when they come in and do passport services, we try to make sure they are aware of what other services uh, that we provide as well. Um, like I said earlier, all circulation staff are trained passport agents. Uh, and only trained passport agents can answer your questions. Uh, I am a passport agent, but I uh, defer to the people who do it uh, more commonly. So they're they're your best bet for the most accurate information. Uh, prior to COVID-19, uh, passport offices were open seven days a week, and we only closed them during winter break, and they were walk-in hours. Now, post COVID-19, you know, well, current COVID-19, the offices are closed, uh, and We'll reopen in the future. Uh, don't know when it's all up to the state um, and those will be by appointment most likely um, just to make it a little easier and to make sure that we don't have too many people coming into the, the building uh, all at the same time. Now, if you have an emergency passport, you can still go to the post office, uh, call them and see what services uh, they arrive, but just be aware that a lot of the people that were working for the state government um, are working from home, and so there it will take you a, a long time to get your passport. But the uh, the post office is providing that service. Um, so the second division that I, I manage is adult services division. Um, so that's adult services, teen services, and the local history room. And I just threw some pictures up here because I thought it's interesting. You know, we do. You know, train ourselves constantly and we read up on how to provide better services to all, all of our, uh, our patrons uh, and my adult and teen service uh, librarians uh, are very well trained and continue their training uh, and our local history librarian slash archivist. Uh, as you can see in that right hand screen, there is a content standard that uh, she uses to organize the collections in the local history room. So it's a little bit different than the Dewey Decimal System that we use um, throughout the rest of the library. Now, adult services program that we were doing before the pandemic, uh, we had town and gown speakers every couple of months. Uh, sometimes we had them monthly. The most latest ones were on internet safety and a history of borders and movement. Um, we also had our distinguished speaker series. Uh, Susan Strait came in and spoke about her uh, books, uh, the Simpson, Sim, sorry, Simpsons animator came in, underwater photography. We had a beekeeper come in. That was a very, very well attended program. Uh, there's actually a library up north. I forget where it is, but they have beehives up on the top of their uh, roof and they have the um, someone come in monthly and they take the honey and then they sell the honey as a, a library honey. Uh, so there's all kinds of different things that, that libraries do. Um, recurring adult services that we had before the pandemic, we did Thursday matinees, we had art house films, we have a very large DVD collection that we're very proud of, um, that we add to constantly. Uh, we also had a Fuller to Public Library Writers Guild that was a bi-monthly service. Uh, we've had a couple of people uh, run that program for us, and they both have done an excellent job. Uh, we had a monthly crafting color event, and then crafts, 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 which was monthly. And then we had a donuts and dragons uh, book club that was a monthly program. Uh, so we were we were very busy. Um, so adult programming now. So we've gone digital. Um, not only have we gone digital, but the children's services department has gone digital as well, and they'll tell you more about that later on. Um, we do book blasts. Uh, we have daily guests, the title featuring, uh, sorry, featuring uh, emoticons and famous quotes. And that one has been very popular. Uh, we used to have a board game empire in the library and now we're doing it online during lunch break. Um, not staff's lunch break, they're being paid to do the program, but during your lunch break, um, we have the thing in the library book club, uh, which is a newer program that we've started. We often post weekly relaxation videos to our social media pages, and we had a recreate book cover challenge, which we hope more people will get involved with. If you see Great Gatsby, uh, that's one of our adult services librarian's daughter uh, redoing the Great Gatsby, which I, I love. Um, uh, and then we're working on outreach. Uh, we post to our social media, so Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, 
We're creating YouTube videos almost constantly. Uh, we have an, uh, an excellent, uh, we'll call it director, Kent uh, Baker, is doing a fantastic job of editing a lot of videos for us. We do grab bags for curbside pickup. So if you can't really think of books that you want, but you just say, hey, I love mysteries or thrillers or you know, love stories, or you like the romance novels, let us know and we'll grab some real popular books that we have available. Uh, and we'll put them in a little grab bag for you and you can come and pick them up. Um, and at the beginning of this presentation, we had a little video introducing you to the library that we had some technical issues with, but it is posted up on our YouTube page. Uh, we had a shorter version on here, but that is a 12 minute version. So it's very extensive, but it gives you a nice introduction to all the staff, uh, circulation, adult services and children's services. So take a look at that when you, when you get a chance. Um, outreach, we're still continuing to uh, have outreach events, but we're doing them through uh, Zoom meetings. Uh, we attend the Fullerton Collaborative Meeting. Uh, Jason just had the La Sierra Adult Transition Program. They were very excited by that program, and that will be a Zoom meeting that we continue on to talk to them about what kind of services, you know, they can um, they can find from us uh, while we're still you know close to the public. Um, children's services will discuss their outreach uh, at a later time. Uh, we also have uh, our adult services uh, summer reading program, Dig Deeper, Read, Investigate, Discover. Still plenty of time to sign up for this. It's online at uh, fullertonlibrary.readsquared.com. You can also go to our just our front page of our website and we have on our scroller we have uh, you can click on any of those images to go to any of the summer reading li uh, links that you want and tune in for weekly book blasts on those and we'll have weekly prizes and two grand prizes. Uh, and now I'm going to turn the adult uh, young adult program services over to Keith Lee Hell, who is our young adult librarian. And I'm the young adult librarian. Um, so during the normal year when we are not in a pandemic, these are some of the young adult programs that we have at the library. Our biggest one is our teen advisory board. Our tab group meets every other week and they are a group of teenagers ranging from 8th grade to 11th grade and they just Guess what kind of programs they want to have in the library. They also kind of tell me if there are books uh, that I am missing from the collection that they want to read. Um, and with them, I've come up with the following um, programs. We do anime afternoons. We had a doodle club where one of our LTAs, our library technical assistants, who is much more artistic than I am, through different How to draw and how to just practice their technique. Good trivia nights, movie nights. Um, uh, the book club that we do with the rest of teens and adults, and same with Fort Game Empire. And then our biggest thing usually we would be doing right now is our summer reading program, where a lot of our teens come in and volunteer in the library. Since summer reading looks a little bit different, I'm still offering volunteer opportunities for our teams digitally. Um, they're submitting book reviews to be posted on our social media and coming up with bookmarks for suggestions of books to read. Next slide. So the area, if you haven't been in the library, it encompasses um, probably a quarter to a half of the top floor. It is reserved for teens only. Um, so the enclosed glass room is all the time. Teenagers, we do not allow adults in there. We won't really want to have a space for teens to come in and read, and do their homework where they can just be themselves. The outer area, we are a little bit more flexible, more for but then teens for 90% of the time. We do let adults come up to check out books for their teens, but not hang out in the area. Slide. Uh, so this is the teen poster for our summer reading program. It is 
all online this year, but all of the requirements are the same. It's they need to read 16 hours to complete the summer reading. Um, and we're still using, even though it's online, we're using the same reading log that the teens in our tab group helped me come up with. Next slide. Uh, so here's some pictures from our board game Empire. We used to meet weekly um, to play in the library. So you can see there's a photo of one of our staff members teaching teens and adults how to play a, a board game. And then now we are still playing um, week, daily and still on Fridays. Um, so that's kind of, I included a picture of what the online board games look like. So you can still, you have the actual game in of your screen, and then on the right-hand side are all your players and all the stuff that you need, your little meeples, and you have the scorecards for how to play. Next slide. Um, so one of our bigger programs is our anime afternoons. We had teens come in every Thursday to watch different anime and talk about their favorite manga. Um, and you can see in the middle picture, they like to come and cosplay. That is not something I told them to do. It was just, they all decided they wanted to come to the library and dress up as their favorite anime characters or just in different costumes. They also are big artists, so I include anime drawings they did. We were going to have a anime instructor come and teach them how to do how to do different anime drawings. Unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we had to cancel that, but we will have him as soon as programs are available to ha happen again in the library. Next slide. So our anime club is still going on. We now meet on Zoom. So we meet every Thursday night. They're actually still meeting right now. Um, we meet from 4.30 to 6 usually, but sometimes they miss each other so much that they keep going for much longer. Um, so we meet on Zoom and we did last week, we had a little trivia competition using Kahoot where one of the teens actually was came up with all the questions and then everyone could join in to submit their answers. Um, but so it's still, they're pretty good. They're enjoying being able to see each other and still watch anime together. Next slide. And then we have our Donuts and Dragons book club has now become the thing in the library book club where we have changed from mostly fantasy books to more horror fantasy books. Um, and we still have our little dragon mascot. Next slide. Uh, so these are some pictures of what the teen advisory board did when we were still meeting. We met twice a month. We planned all the programs. We played games. We ate a lot of food. Um, because you know, if you want teens to come to a program, food is always necessity. Um, and it's really great because, so in our tab group, we have teens from all three of the local high schools, plus teens that are homeschooled. So it really gives them a way to connect to teens that they never would have met otherwise. Um, and we met one week, um, council member Zahara came and talked to my teens about what they want not only in the library, but in the city of Fullerton. Next slide. Now I'm done. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you, Keithley. Um, so you have me again. Uh, just gonna talk real briefly about the local history room. So the local history room was first established in 1973 as uh, part of the new library. Uh, at the current main library. Uh, the Lawner Room opened up as a tribute to Lulu Lawner's late husband, Albert, uh, and his many years of community service. Uh, the collection has uh, since continued to grow largely through contributions for the public. Uh, the current collection is housed in a new state-of-the-art climate control facility 
which is extremely important to make sure uh, you keep it around 61, 62 degrees to make sure that uh, the older materials don't deteriorate. Um, as you can see, uh, it's a local state of the art room. Uh, you can find old photos of your historic homes or business. Uh, you can discover your family's history by using our newspaper archives. Uh, and you can introduce your children to the colorful history of, of Fullerton. Uh, or you can just look at, you know, old memories. Um, while it is closed, the local history librarian is open, uh, the, the is working. Uh, so you can call her with any research questions you might have. Uh, and I just kind of grabbed a couple of questions that were asked. Uh, this question was actually asked uh, by me uh, to our local history library. And I was uh, curious was when Fullerton had ostrich farms and uh, if we had the, the names of them in the collection. So uh, Fullerton Ostrich Farm operated from 1887 to 1925, um, and there were 60 birds that were moved to a farm in Fullerton because they felt like the climate was better suited uh, to the egg nesting. Um, and then 1896, uh, Edward uh, Atherton uh, bought out Northam and became the sole owner of the thriving business. Um, and so um, although he, he died in Christmas Day uh, on the property, uh, but he sold many of his uh, uh, ostrich feathers uh, to ladies who used to, to place them in their hats. Um, so I just thought that was extremely interesting. Um, we also have had a couple of research questions. Actually, at the beginning of the pandemic, the local history room had more questions than any of our other departments uh, did. Um, one of the questions was how many telephones were in Fullerton in 1956? Uh, there was 12,500 subscribers and the telephone exchange was established in 1896 with two subscribers in the gym pharmacy. The gym pharmacy comes back to us again. Um, and so other types of questions, a lot of uh, other departments in the city reach out to us, but also uh, Cal State and uh, Fullerton College students reach out to us. So they had questions about Japanese internment, uh, the citrus strikes, uh, Cherry also provides research assistance for the Fullerton Heritage for the Fullerton College National Re Register application and is working with the planning department for local landmarking for the uh, the neon YMC sign. Uh, so she stays extremely busy. Um, her contact information is there, but we also have it on our website. We have a whole local history page with all of our photos that we've had that we've had digitized digitized available for you to view. Um, when we reopen, uh, you'll be able to come and use the Haynes directory. Uh, we have the full Haynes directory uh, going back to the uh, early 70s. Um, actually, a little before, I think we have some from the 60s. And we're one of the few libraries, uh, we might be the only library in Orange County that has a full set. Um, so we have a lot of people that come and use or came and use that collection while we are open. Um, so the third division that I am responsible for is our technical services division. Uh, so, sorry, let's see. so as you can see from those photos, the wide of array of different uh, things happen in the technical services department. Um, and you'll see that's why the sorter is there, but those are uh, books that come into the uh, the downstairs technical services area and they're awaiting processing to come into the collection. So there's actually three kind of main parts of uh, technical services department within libraries and each public library is a little different. Um, we have acquisitions, which uh, they're in charge of purchasing materials uh, like the books, audiobooks, DVDs, uh, and other items, so what the librarians and services, teen services and children's services are responsible for deciding on what materials are gonna go into the collection. The technical services department uh, gets, takes those orders and places them with our, uh, what we call book jobbers. Um, work with several different vendors to bring books into, books, DVDs and audiobooks into the library. Uh, we do that all electronically. So that's why library IT is in that department. Um, and uh, we also have um, a cataloger in that department. Uh, we have a couple of other acquisitions people and a couple of people that work part-time in that department to help out. 
um, and the cataloging, they help get that material ready for the catalog so you uh, can search it. The subject terms, key terms, uh, and descriptions of the, of the book so you can read a little bit about the book and know what you're going to check out. Uh, the library IT uh, part of the department is responsible for computers, uh, servers, and our systems management. Um, that's done through what we call our integrated library system, and that's just basically the backbones to the cataloging system. Uh, and also um, with the circulation department, uh, the, when you go and apply for a library card, they enter that information into our what we call our ILS or integrated library system. But we work very closely with the city IT, uh, but we also have a very specific library software that only librarians uh, really know how to use because we're we use them more often than uh, city IT departments do. Uh, it's the integrated library system plus our time management system uh, for our computers uh, and, and a whole host of, of other items. And as you can see here, you know, libraries aren't just about books. Uh, this is uh, some artwork that was created by the American Library Association. It just shows you the various things that happen in libraries: you know, lifelong learning, intellectual freedom. Uh, it's where you can come, and you, if you have you're curious about something, you can have that curiosity. Uh, hopefully, need met. Uh, Literacy is obviously huge for us, as is access, privacy, community, diversity, and education, because we are in the education community. Um, now, we also have digital resources, and the main digital resources that we have are ebooks and e audiobooks. Uh, we use Overdrive for uh, ebooks and e audiobooks. We also have uh, an app called Libby, it's from the same company. It's just Depends on, you know, what features you like more as to what app you would use. And this is just a small selection of books that are available in that collection. Uh, we have over 8,000 items in that collection and we're adding to it constantly. We just uh, add, added items this week uh, and we'll be adding items uh, more over the next uh, week or two as we close out our fiscal year, which ends at the end of June. Um, as you can see, since uh, we have pretty good checkout numbers, but they've increased significantly uh, since COVID-19 started. In fact, in April, there was a 32.48% increase, and in May, there was a 29.79% increase in the number of e-books and e-audiobooks that were checked out. And that is adult books, teen books, and children's books as well. Um, some of the more popular books that have been borrowed uh, from our library and every other library as well. These are the most popular books. Where the Crawdads Sing, Educated, you know, Little Fires Everywhere, Nine Perfect Strangers. Uh, and the audiobooks are, are pretty similar. Um, really, the, the difference is audiobooks is Girl, Wash Your Face, and Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone are the most popular. And uh, that's for adult, teen, and children's. Uh, I love. The Harry Potter stories and the, the audio books are, are my favorite way of um, returning to that story. Uh, now, the most popular children's books, this is the just a few. Uh, Hunger Games, of course, but Dogman, Stream, we probably can't even keep those on the shelves when the new ones come out. Artemis Fowl, um, Diary of the Wimpy Kid, extremely popular as well, as are the Captain Underpants and Big Nate. It's, all extremely, extremely popular and very difficult. We order a lot of copies of these books and they're constantly off the shelves. Um, another resource you might not know about are digital magazines. It's uh, from RB Digital. It used to be Zinio. It's now the RB Digital app. And this is just a selection of some of the magazines that we have available in that collection. And we also have a wide uh, array of database and learning resources. We have Mango languages, if you want to learn any kind of language, I think they have over 75 languages now. Tumble Book Library is extremely popular with the kids, as is World Book uh, Online. And then for uh, people in college or teens, adults, we have the Job and Career Accelerator and Learning Express Library. Uh, 
uh, and that's provided by EBSCO. Uh, that shows, as you see, there's career preparation, high school equivalency center, college admission test prep. Uh, it's it's a very good resource, and it has a lot a lot of uh, helpful guides in it. And right above that, you'll see that we also have an electronic uh, subscription to the New York Times. You can go on our website, and it's a little different way of accessing it, but that was given uh, provided to all public libraries in the state of California. So that is uh, one of the resources that we don't pay for. We just get it uh, for free uh, from the state library. Uh, and now I'm going to turn it over to Janine Jacobs, our Children's Services Division Manager. Hi, everybody. I'm Janine Jacobs. Hopefully you can see me now. And let's, and I um, have been a long time employee of the city of Fullerton and the library. I started my career straight out of college as a page, putting away the books in the library, actually while I was attending college. And I've pretty much done every position from page to division manager that I'm currently occupying. I also worked at Santa Ana Public Library and I also worked at Westminster Branch of the Orange County Public Library. Um, I have a lot of things in common with Ken, a lot of the things are similar, but we in children's services are care, cater to children ages birth through eighth grade. We have lots of programming. We serve the adults with children and we have family programming as well. I'll talk a little bit more about that in the future. Our goal is to equip children with uh, literacy and develop lifelong love of learning. So they develop the skills for that. We have approximately 70,000 physical items in our library as well as 1,330 some odd eBooks in OverDrive and numerous audio books. We uh, acts have, our goal is to provide materials to children of all ages that are developmentally appropriate and working with a ver variety of learning styles. We have um, access, we want to have access for children to all media. And we also have within the children's library, the AWE early literacy stations, which are designed for really young children to begin to use the computer. We've got lots of children's programs going on all the time. We work very hard to make sure our programs are age appropriate. We have young children's programs designed to build essential literacy skills and toddler programs. We have things for parents to model on ways to support their children's development. We assist with emotional and intellectual development of all kids, especially the young ones. We have an outstanding after school club program, which helps develop critical thinking and collaboration. Um, it's designed to expand the horizons by hands on explorations and chances to try out new things and experiences. We have live performances. Um, we have all sorts of things, arts and science, especially. We also have a uh, very special program that's near and dear to my heart, the Read with the Dogs program. It's open to families. It's designed um, for children. It's pretty well documented that children can improve their library, their reading ability by spending time reading to dogs. And we have been doing this for just about nine years. It'll be actually nine years in December. And we have had um, up to 22 dogs. Our highest attendance at that Read with the Dogs program has been in a summer evening when we actually had over 100 people. It's a drop-in program, so everybody doesn't stay the whole time. They come and read to the dogs, and then um, they move around the room visiting and reading with the dogs. It's had a lot of wonderful effects. We've got numerous parents that have expressed their appreciation for their children's reading abilities increasing. But we've had other kind of poignant things, like the, the children whose parents are afraid of dogs and they don't want their children to be afraid of dogs. So they bring them to our Read with the Dogs program. The dogs are provided by pet prescription team with their handlers and each of the dogs are uh, well-trained and they're very gentle, a good opportunity for somebody that's fearful of dogs to get to know dogs and find out they're not so bad. 
We also have a teen volunteer program, and a lot of the kids in our teen volunteer program also are with uh, Keithley in the young adult section. In our teen volunteer program, it's a kind of an opportunity for older children to work hands on with younger kids. Uh, a lot of them appreciate that they are giving back to the community by helping these kids. It also gives them a little bit of job experience that they can apply to the real world. We could not do our programs in the summer, especially without teen volunteers. We have ongoing family programs of Lego Day. We have family movie night once a month. We have um, winter and spring family nights. We have a celebration of the arts and a science celebration each year as well. Whole family are invited to that. They're fantastic evenings with great special performers and lots of community involvement, particularly our science celebration, which we were unable to do this year, where members of the community from the, the, the College of Optometry, Ketchum University, to um, Fullerton School District, to the Museum Center and the Children's Museum at La Habra all come and have hands-on activities for the kids to participate in. Next slide, please. Thanks. Okay. Now, with the with the, what's going on now, we have had to curtail a lot of our fabulous programs. But what we've done is we've moved them to digital versions. And right now, you can do uh, a different program is put up every every day, Monday through Friday. We put up something new. We have on Mondays a little spoonful program, which is geared for the toddlers and preschoolers. And Miss Gina is the is doing those. She has lots of things that she shows for parents to do with their children. It's very interactive. Miss Gina also does a story break, which is a story once a week, a news story that she, if you haven't watched it, check it out. She's a very animated reader and it prevents, presents a fabulous story for preschoolers. Preschoolers. We have a puppet post, which is me. I do those. I do puppet shows and puppet stories for all ages. We have Read with the Dogs virtually, where our handlers have filmed a video at uh, their home of the dogs. So they read to the dogs, and then they pause and give the kids a couple of minutes to read to the dog on the screen. We also have um, a virtual lockbox challenge, which is a puzzle and uh, program, or actually an interactive challenge for school-age kids. It introduces a new series of books, plus it's a little bit challenging to figure out the puzzles. Next slide, please. So we do a lot of outreaches. We pride ourselves on, we try to, any outreach we're invited to in Fullerton, we, we try to get to those outreaches. We do all sorts of things um, from the open house of the Fullerton Police Department to uh, also National Night Out, also Fullerton Police Department. We've done Faces of Fullerton, Airport Day, lots of school outreaches. We've gone to, back to school nights, we've gone to literacy nights. One of the popular ones actually at the literacy nights is we're able to bring therapy dogs with us from our pet prescription therapy dog library team to the kids. Usually on outreaches, we share stories, do puppet shows, book talks. We also do crafts, STEM activities. Um, we speak to groups about literacy, careers in the libraries, all sorts of things, and we always customize the presentations to whatever works for the group. Next slide, please. So now with things shut down, we don't have as many opportunities to outreach, do outreach, but we still have some going. Just before the, uh, the schools closed down, we were able to uh, reach out through the school district and distribute 2,300 books provided from the, by the Friends of the Library to the kids that take part in the lunch program. In addition to that, we handed out with the books our summer reading club game sheets in the hope that the children could participate in the reading club. We also um, are currently actually uh, working in a collaboration with the Richmond Neighborhood Center and uh, Today, they actually picked up game sheets and things, and they will uh, do the reading club. And we're doing what we can to work with them. Next slide, please. Speaking of summer reading club, summer reading club is our one of our favorite times of the year. We always have a big summer reading club. As a matter of fact, 
the first summer reading club in Fullerton was in 1927. And we have historically had a summer reading club every single year from 1942 to present. This year's summer reading club is being done by the students signing up and doing it uh, digitally through the library's web page or and the kids uh, get the game sheet. You can kind of see it on the left of the slide. They'll get a game sheet that encourages them to read. If they complete the game sheet, that's 1,440 minutes or 24 hours of reading, and they'll earn eight prizes along the way. Each time they earn a prize, they get a, a virtual badge. And then hopefully when we open up again, I'm, I'm guessing around July, but at some point when we open up, they'll get physical prizes. And they'll, following the school district's grab and go idea, they will check in with us and come and grab their prize and come in and check out a few more books and then go. Um, our summer reading club so far, as of this morning, we have 342 children enrolled in it, and they've already read 52,344 minutes. Now, that's lower than usual. Last year, we had 2,436 children who read for over 2 million minutes, but we've only been doing this for 10 days, and uh, we hope to uh, get more and more children involved in our summer reading club, as well as it, as teens in the teen reading club and of course adults in the adult reading club. Next slide. Back to Judy. All right, thank you, Janine. So um who uses libraries? So here we've got a little bit of information about that. So obviously people still read physical books and the typical American adult reads four books in the past 12 months. And the average reader reads about 12 books a year. And I, what I enjoy is down in the lower right of the screen, you'll see um, people's preferences as far as um, what, what format they like to use. So we have 39% read print books only. And then, uh, I'm sorry, I can't see the, the figure on the other side there. <laughs> Uh, my uh, my application is blocking it, um, but uh, is that 28, 29% um, only read digital, right? And then there's 7% who um, can read either. So, and then we, of course, we have our non-book readers as well. So uh, it's a variety of ways. Um, let's go to the next slide. All right. Um, one of the books I read in this past year was very influential for me. Uh, I got to see the author of this book at the California Library Association's um, conference last fall. And his book is called Palaces for the People. It's by uh, Eric Kleinenberg. And he is a sociologist who studied um, communities. And one of the, the first communities he studied, and this has been many years ago, I think in the late 70s or the early 80s, there was a blackout in Chicago and he studied the effects of that. And what he discovered was that communities that have so strong social infrastructures in place can recover from disaster um, um, and other um, weather problems, et cetera, much better than those that do not have social infrastructures. And the library was one of the main uh, social infrastructures that he cited, along with you know with other um, social infrastructures, and, and it has to do with us hanging out with strangers in a safe environment and meeting new people and interacting, and and that's exactly what happens in a library. And I would highly recommend this book for anyone who's interested in social infrastructure. Next slide, please. Okay, so who uses libraries? I, I think it's always interesting when I might be introduced to someone new, especially if they're my age or so, or even younger, they'll say, a library director, they still have libraries? Yes, <laughs> but we find that there's hope because millennials are the most likely generation of Americans to use public libraries. Um, in fact, more millennials have visited a public library in the past year than any other adult generation. And you can see the statistics there. 
Uh, these uh, statistics were gathered by the Pew Research uh, Center uh, in about 2016. And they did it, they liked to you know, study various aspects of American life. And um, so we really get to benefit from what they, they found out. So in fact, you look at the last bullet point in May of 2017, the report, four in 10 millennials, 41% used a library website in the last 12 months compared with 24% of boomers. Next slide, please. Okay, so what's going on? Why are they using the library? Well, part of it is, uh, as Ken mentioned in his technical services uh, presentation, with, with the many computers we have in our uh, public areas, and also, uh, you'll, you'll hear this later at our capital improvement project area, um, we have been trying to stay up with technology and have really strong internet connections and the availability of computers. And of course, since we're dedicated to people's privacy, uh, that bodes well for us. People know that we are not gonna sell their information or somehow let them have their information be compromised. And um, the extra services for millennials, because of course, those are the people that are 35 years through 18. That's the childbearing, mostly our childbearing years. So a lot of them are looking for literacy programs for their young children. Also students really, and this was a high priority when we did the expansion in 2011, was having study rooms. Students really need to collaborate. Education is not just learning what's in front of you, it's being able to interact with others. And part of that is our, our current model for employees. We want employees to be able to collaborate with one another and study rooms uh, facilitate that. And of course, there are meeting spaces for community groups. And uh, the other thing that libraries have is uh, an opportunity for uh, the public to try out new technologies. And one of the, the we mentioned 3D printers, which we would like to um, May, increase our maker space or maker area. But currently we do have a virtual reality gear that we do uh, bring out as part of the, our programming as well. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so I thought this was a fascinating way of looking at it. So in the blue column, we say find, uh, what percentage of adults are finding information that's trustworthy and reliable? And millennials, eight, ages 18 to 35, 87% of them think that that can happen at, at the library. And for uh, the middle column, learning new things, 85% of millennials believe that they can learn new things by coming to the library. I, I'm, I'm with them, although I'm not a millennial. And then our last column is uh, get information that helps them with decisions they have to make. And 63% and of them uh, believe that that is, can happen at the library. Uh, it was very interesting, again, from Pew. So just like we talked about with uh, palaces for the people, libraries create strong communities and um, uh, libraries transform. So here's another uh, more research that was done uh, in surveying the public. If your local public library closed, would it have a major impact, minor impact, or no impact on uh, at the top, you can say that the community, 66% uh, that thought that closing the library would have a, a, a major impact on their community. And uh, only 6% thought it wouldn't make any difference at all. Um, but also for, it was interesting for, when they thought about the closure of the library for themselves and their family, it was evenly divided, which is, I think, a fascinating. Um, I, I'd like to know more about that. And one of my favorites, personal learners. So uh, if you meet me, if you tell me you're a personal learner, I'm gonna be really excited to, to, to meet you because I think that is so, so very important. Uh, and we wanna create that opportunity for people to, if they haven't been personal learners, that they can um, get their curiosity peaked and become personal learners. So 80% of those 18 ages, ages 18 and above, um, are, their motive is to learn something that makes their life more interesting. Um, and then and as it keeps working, working down. Um, and then, and even, even you can look at the, the, the last one, learning something to help my children or others with their, their schoolwork. Um, that was the, the one thing I, when I was a children's librarian, 
uh, very often either during school time or after school, parents would come in because their children might have been stuck. In reading. A lot of times that happened in the earlier grades, maybe grades two through four, but really it could happen at any time. And one of the things that I, I hope to be able to offer them was in our children's library, we have so many ways to enjoy or pique people's children's interest in literacy. Uh, for my family, it was definitely listening to audiobooks together. It brought us closer. Um, yes, I understand my son, Michael, he was not decoding, but we were still enjoying the story together. And if I was paying attention to traffic and missed something, and I said, hey, Michael, why did they go in the cave? And if he says something like, well, mom, I, I don't know, I just saw this Ferrari go by, so we back it up, we listen again. Those are all important things. Reading things over again, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide, please. All right. And so we have some of the uh, some of the results of the Pew study, and 65% of the people studied say that libraries help them grow as people. And 49% uh, think libraries help them focus on things that matter in their lives. And um, I mean, I think of Miss Gina and uh, the way families. I also did the Bedtime Bears Family Story Time, and my own family went to Bedtime Bears Family Time. And, and really, it put a hold on the other things we were doing for one evening to sit down as a, as a family and enjoy live entertainment. And it was, it was precious. And we also see that 43% believe libraries help them cope with a busy world. Our library isn't the quietest library, but it is, I think of it as a sanctuary of sorts. So we've got 38% say libraries help them cope in a world where it's hard to get ahead. And that's where some of the items that Ken pointed out with um, our online learning resources can be very helpful. And our staff is very knowledgeable on how they got, got on, maybe uh, which might be best for whatever situation you might have. Um, we're always happy to help. And the activities of visitors to libraries and two thirds of library visitors do come to borrow print books. That's why we're really excited that we've got the curbside service going. And around half come to sit and read again, maybe that's that quiet place, or to study or to engage with media. And 27% of library users have attended programs or classes or lectures at the library. And we are so proud of our connection with Cal State Fullerton and other institutions in our programming. So here we are. Uh, that red rectangle is pretty important because more than a the library is transformed because more than a quarter of U.S. households don't have a computer with an internet connection. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, all of our residents have an opportunity to take advantage of what is online and available digitally, and they can't do that if they don't have a connection uh, with the internet. And as you can see, uh, this is a, a couple years old, but uh, it shows how many libraries have free Wi-Fi, 12,000, probably more by now. And uh, the Borders has 1,300 and Starbucks 11,000, although that number, as we know, is it's changing um, due to the recent developments. Now, current and future library trends. Well, one of the most recent trends for us is um, looking at the possibility of removing barriers. Uh, that would be for our fines and fees and, and how that affects the access to services. So in January of 2019, the American Library Association came out with a recommendation for libraries to truly reconsider how much fees and fines can become barriers to, the, to access of, of libraries. And so at their May meeting, our library trustees were asked to consider such a change in our fee schedule. And as I did the research on this, um, and other libraries have found it successful, and some of it seems counterintuitive, and please contact me if you have questions about that. But um, Janine Jacobs did some research, because one of the things that I was thinking about is that we haven't had daily fines on children's items for a very long time. So I want to know when when did that start? So Janine was able to look it up in our uh, the, the 90 year history of the Children's Library, which is called wonderfully the Bing Bang Book Machine or 90 
razzle-dazzle years in the children's room. And uh, what it was is that when the library moved from what is now the museum center over to its current building, the children's uh, department moved first. And so the children's supervisor, Carolyn Johnson, who later became uh, director of the library, uh, proposed to the uh, trustees uh, this, quote, in order to give all the children of Fullerton the right to read through the resources of the Fullerton Public Library, we will eliminate fines on children's materials for an experimental period of one year, beginning with the opening of the new library on June 24, 1973. And uh, I was so pleased that our library board uh, decided that they would do, they would approve a six month experiment, especially not just um, the idea of removal of barriers in the normal sense. But in May, as we know, we were still and still are in the throes of the pandemic and the economic um, impact that has had on so many families. And we would hate to think that families don't have access to all the books they need to supply their, their children. Many of them are working with the schools, but homeschooling to some degree. And I know as a mom of four kids, keeping kids reading and interested in what they're reading and adding variety is, is really a challenge. So I was very proud of our board. And so um, at the end of the period, which will be on December 31st of 2020, uh, the staff will look at our, our statistics in early January and present a report to the board uh, at their meeting at near the end of January on the, on the fourth Thursday uh, for them to consider um, how our experiment went. And then we uh, obviously we have civic engagement um, we, um, before uh, the pandemic, we uh, were very encouraging of the, um, the Census 2020 of, you know, opportunities for people to volunteer and also they could also fill out their form um, at the library, as well as uh, we were an 11 day vote center this last March 3rd. And that was very exciting. We had that in our conference center and I'm very proud of that, op that opportunity to serve the County of Orange and our residents um, to be a vote center. And then um, assisting with community pro priorities through partnerships as I talked about the Hunt Library partnership. Next slide. So the future. So here's a th few things in our future, capital improvement projects, technology improvements, because obviously we've been a leader before, we don't wanna fall behind and also expanding outreach to our community. Capital improvement project. So here's our Osborne Auditorium. As you can see how it looks now, there's the, the front with the stages and then the back of the room where uh, those two uh, panels open up to additional rooms. And then uh, we're, the, we're working with engineering on looking at other options and this is a uh, this is what we're looking at. We'd love to have that stage um, not be so unusual in its configuration, just, just be normal stage and also have uh, stage lighting. Right now, the lights are more general in the room. So that's one of the ideas that we have. And then um, we also want to look at the, uh, the teen spaces we have. Uh, I think we'd really like to do more with makerspace. And you can see what other libraries have done there on the left and on the, the right to make their spaces inviting for teens and also uh, having the experience hands on of using technology. And then our children's room uh, could use some updating. Um, up in the teen area, we would also would like to have an area for junior high schoolers to hang out more. As you can see on the, the picture on the right that was on the last screen there, right there, that area in the junior high area is more of a walkthrough. So we'd like to have it be a place that's more comfortable as Keithy was talking about, a place for teens to, to hang out and enjoy each other and, um, and, um, and communicate here at the library. So here are some um, areas of the library that need improvement. When we have story time, that play area is <laughs> no way big enough for children to actually play as they're waiting for the bell to ring and to go into Osborne. Um, and then also when you look at our computer area, um, 
technology has really changed and uh, all of our computers have gotten so much smaller and this furniture is rather big. So it might be possible to reuse the, the space in the room more efficiently and, and have it adapt as we do constantly to the changing Fullerton community. And here's some examples from other libraries you can see. Um, beautiful with their trees and their whimsy. And I believe this is Long Beach for their beautiful beach theme. So um, those are things we're looking forward to. And in technology improvements, I want to mention the E-rate. We're very fortunate that the, uh, the Universal Services Schools and Libraries Program uh, works hard to provide discounts to public libraries as well as K through 12 schools because we don't want our, our public institutions to fall behind and not have the access that, that private concerns can have. And so we have applied to uh, have an upgrade and we would be, we, uh, would be responsible for 20% of the cost and then the grant would cover the other 80%. So we're, we're hoping that we do um, um, win that award. And um, so the new equipment would able to get us able to purchase higher broadband capability in the future, as well as improve the Wi-Fi connectivity within the library, because it was set up several years ago. And um, again, we want to keep moving forward and not fall behind. We want to also expand outreach to the community. And you can see Fullerton's a big place. And uh, we, uh, we're, we're glad we have some digital ways to reach out. We also want to have more opportunities to keep connecting with the community. So a little bit about what libraries do. Um, it's not just about books so much. It's, it's community hubs, connecting people to information and people to people. And, you know, a safe haven for kids when school's not in session. Um, there's after school uh, homework that can be done, games and book clubs. And in computer classes, uh, we have, uh, when we were open to the public more generally, we had one-on-one -on -one, uh, computer tutoring that was very, very popular. And also, as you said, saw, we, through the years, have used bookmobiles to reach communities. In fact, even me as, as a kid. All kinds of ways. I don't think librarians will ever stop trying to figure out how to help people with learning and, and uh, discovering new things. So here's, a, here's an important point, L providing access, leveling the playing field, just like that E-rate will do. And uh, because we serve people of every age, every income level, uh, what the location, ethnicity, or physical ability, and, um, and providing resources to live, learn, govern, and work. And of course, to promote literacy. And nowadays, obviously, literacy takes many forms and uh, it includes computer literacy, literacy as well, because we wanna thrive and survive in a global information world. And uh, the ability to read and use computers is absolutely essential. Next slide, all right. And libraries protect your rights. Libraries are advocates for your right to read and your right to reader privacy. Um, and also freedom of information is fundamental to, to the American way of life and the free and full access sets us apart from many other countries. And we are working to preserve freedom to read in order to enhance learning and ensure access to information for everyone. And also a very high priority is protecting people's confidentiality. And of course, innovating. We, we, learning, it's about going to the next step, keep pushing forward. So uh, we are places for community engagement and a platform for great minds to come together. Uh, again, like our town and gown. Um, I remember one of the best attended programs is right after the earthquake in La Habra. We happened to have a professor a few days later from Cal State Fullerton to speak about earthquakes. And we had the room packed because people want to know stuff. And um, sometimes just Googling isn't enough. We, we want to connect with other people. And um, here we go. Uh, libraries need funding. As I, as I spoke earlier, um, we're, we're grateful for our position in the general fund, but we certainly rely on the activities of the foundation and the friends to support us. And we hope that you will uh, 
if you believe, as we do, that library is important, you'll reach out to the legislators at the city level, the, the, the county level, because we, we want our whole county to be literate, literate um, at every single level to um, support libraries. And here's a way to connect with us. There's many different ways. And you hopefully, if you, if you saw our information, you can connect with each of us as managers um, if you have questions. And I think there are a few questions from the audience. And um, <clears throat> there's a question from Arnel Dino, and he says, as a source of revenue and programming, has the library partnered with outside vendors in order to create programming? or RFPs for programming like the Hunt Partnership with Heritage OC, um, or partnered with other program funding. And I'm, I'm gonna pass this to Ken and Janine. I think Ken is ready to answer that question. So um, hopefully, as you know, public libraries were about free stuff. Uh, we want you to check out books for free, check out DVDs for free. We want you to come to our programs for free. Uh, having said that, we have worked with our library foundation on a couple of programs. Uh, the most recent program we worked on with the foundation was called Autographing 101. Um, and I, I almost kind of forgot about this program until uh, um, this uh, question was asked. Uh, and we had uh, Steve Grad and Andy Luke come in and people could come and with their their items and find out if they were real, if they were valued, if you had a signed copy from uh, of a photo from every person that was on the original Star Trek, you could find out whether those were real signatures or, or not. Um, they are um, currently on, I don't know if they're still on or not, but they're autograph authenticators on History Channel's Pawn Stars and Elite Authenticator of Beckett Authentication Services. Um, so this was a very, you know, very, very popular program, but you know, Judy mentioned the other program that was really popular at the earthquakes, but uh, since I've been at the library, the most popular program was we had Blizzard come out and we had those artists and creators uh, from Blizzard uh, Gaming came out and talked about what it is to, you know, work for Blizzard, what it's like, what they do. Uh, and that room was packed. In fact, we were in that room an hour and a half after the presentation ended to uh, let people continue asking their questions. Um, so for Can I now, jump in, Ken? Yep, go ahead, Jenny. From the, from the kids' perspective, um, we have a program called After School Club, and we frequently have um, people from the, the community um, come and, and present things of interest to, to kids. We also have, um, thanks, courtesy of the um, Friends of the library, we've had paid performers, we've had uh, concerts uh, in our family nights. And so we, we also through our celebration of um, science, we usually have a paid, uh, uh, sorry, our, our science night, we have a paid presenter, but we also have our community partners that present hands-on activities for the kids to do. That's a fabulous night. I really miss the fact that we couldn't do it this year. So we do a variety of free performances in collaboration with community partners, as well as performances paid for by the um, Friends of the Library. All right. Um, see any other uh, questions, perhaps on Facebook Live? Someone asking about when pools are gonna reopen, but I don't have an answer for that. Well, guess what? Uh, next week, we might find out the answer because next week, Citizen Academy will feature the Parks and Recs Department here from the city of Fullerton. And Hugo Curiel and his staff, I'm sure, will tell us a lot of things we may not yet know about all the parks and trails here in Fullerton. And with that, I, I think we're ready to wrap it up. Thank you so much for joining us today and uh, please reach out to us if you have more questions about the Fullerton Public Library. Thank you and good evening. <laughs>